Hi, I'm a possum and I find garbage, and I saw Five Nights at Freddy's, a movie based on a series of video games about a family restaurant full of murderous mascot robots, starring the guy from the Hunger Games movies for some reason. Five Nights at Freddy's is based on the idea that these types of singing animatronic mascots like Chuck E. Cheese and the Showbiz Pizza Bear are creepy, which they are. And the funny thing is, series creator Scott Cawthon first made a game for children called Chipper and Sons Lumber Co., but people on Steam Greenlight complained that his character designs were creepy, so he just decided to lean into it and came up with Five Nights at Freddy's, which ended up becoming massively successful thanks to YouTubers pretending to be more scared by it than they really were, and now he's too rich to care what anyone thinks. Speaking of YouTubers, there are a couple cameos from YouTubers, like that prick from those Game Theory videos, and some guy who calls himself Cory X Kenshin, who I've never heard of. I guess Markiplier was too busy working on his Iron Lung movie, and PewDiePie was too busy being Swedish. Most of what I know about the Five Nights at Freddy's games are what I've learned through secondhand exposure. I've only ever played the first game, and I never finished it. As far as I'm aware, the first game doesn't have any supernatural elements. They're just a guy trying to survive while a bunch of robots try to kill you. And the robots aren't necessarily evil, they're just dumb machines who couldn't recognize a human and would mistake you for the endoskeleton of another mascot and forcibly shove you into a robot, where you would get shredded by gears and stuff. I don't think any of this stuff about ghosts and serial killers was established until the later games. So really, I have no idea if this movie is true to the lore at all, so I can't judge it based on whether or not it is. The 12 year olds wearing costumes in the row in front of me in the theater, who I assume were all Five Nights at Freddy's fans, all seem to like it. But I don't know if a 12 year old would be conscious of whether or not it was consistent with the lore, or if they would be satisfied just seeing their favorite toys on screen, no matter what the justification is, or if they're smarter than the typical adult Disney, Star Wars, and MCU fan. I was surprised to find that this movie actually has quite a lot of plot. I recently reviewed The Nun 2, and said that one had the bare minimum of what could even be called a plot, and it was really just a loose framework to hang on a bunch of setups for horror shenanigans. But the Five Nights at Freddy's movie actually has a story with characters. I mean, some of their goals and motivations don't make any sense. But the movie has them. It's much more complicated than I expected a Five Nights at Freddy's movie to be. If only it made sense. Almost all of my problems with this movie have to do with the plot. So the rest of this video is going to be spoilers. Let me just give a quick rundown of what happens if you haven't seen it. Our protagonist, Mike Schmidt, witnessed his little brother Garrett being kidnapped while his family was out on a camping trip when he was a kid. Now, as an adult, one of his parents is dead and the other is gone somewhere, so he has custody of his little sister, Abby. Mike loses his job as a mall cop after assaulting a man who he mistook for a kidnapper. This would seem to establish Mike as a violent person full of righteous fury, but he never does anything like that again. Anyway, he desperately needs a new job so his evil aunt, Jane, can't convince the state that he's an unfit guardian so she can take custody of Abby and use her to collect checks from the government. However, his career counselor, Steve Raglan, tells him the only available job he qualifies for is as a night watchman for Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, a now-defunct Chuck E. Cheese-style family restaurant featuring a singing animatronic band of mascots. While on the job, Mike uses pills to fall asleep so he can dream about the day Garrett got kidnapped, working on the theory that we remember every detail about everything we experience, but those details get buried in the recesses of our minds. His plan is to relive that moment over and over until he remembers some detail that can lead to identifying the man who took Garrett. Mike does this regularly, but this time, he sees several children who have never appeared in his dream before. He tries to ask the children if they know who took Garrett, but they run away, as kids in horror movies always do whenever they see the protagonist. The following night, Mike falls asleep on the job again, and one of the kids in his dream slashes his arm as he wakes up to the sound of the door buzzer. He answers it and meets a police officer named Vanessa Shelley, who points out that his arm is bleeding before showing him around the restaurant and explaining that five kids were murdered there in the 1980s and their bodies were never found. After his shift on the third night, Mike leaves the restaurant and a group of goons hired by Jane break in to trash the place in an attempt to get Mike fired. But the mascots come to life and kill them. However, one of those goons was actually Abby's babysitter, Max, who Mike didn't know was hired by Jane to spy on him. And now that she's dead, Mike has to bring Abby with him to work. While Mike is asleep, Abby wanders off and meets the mascots and ends up befriending them, and they in turn befriend Mike and Vanessa. Through Abby communicating with the mascots, Mike learns that they're possessed by the ghosts of the murdered children, 
and their leader is a mysterious yellow rabbit. Abby is injured in an accident while playing with the mascots and Vanessa tells Mike not to bring her back there again. The next day, Mike gets Jane to babysit Abby, which makes Abby angry at him, and he goes to work and falls asleep again, but this time, in his dream, the kids tell him they can keep him in a dream world with Garrett forever if he gives them Abby. When he refuses, the kids attack him in his dream, resulting in injuries in real life, and one of the possessed mascots goes to his house, kills Jane, and takes Abby back to the restaurant. Apparently, the mascots have the ability to leave the restaurant, but they just don't most of the time for some reason. Mike wakes up strapped to a chair while a mascot head falls spinning gears are slowly lowered toward his face, but he manages to escape and flees the restaurant with Vanessa. After explaining what happened in his dream, Vanessa reveals that she's the daughter of a serial killer named William Afton, who kidnapped and murdered Garrett and the five other children, and the souls of his victims are under his control. Mike realizes that William is planning to make the mascots kill Abby, so Vanessa gives him a taser and a stun gun to fight the mascots and rescue her. Mike rescues Abby from the mascots, but gets separated and is attacked by a man in a yellow rabbit costume who reveals himself to be the career counselor from earlier, Steve. But it turns out his real name is William Afton, the serial killer. William stabs Vanessa for betraying him, but before he could kill Mike, Abby draws a picture of a yellow rabbit killing children, and this causes the kids possessing the mascots to remember that William killed them. I guess because they couldn't remember that for some reason. And they turn on him. But they don't actually do anything. The cupcake one just bites a chunk out of his suit and causes a spring-loaded contraption inside him to stab him. And they all just kind of stand there and watch him as he falls to the floor. It's like the kids will gladly bite someone in half just because she's there, but they won't kill the guy who killed them. Anyway, William gets injured, and the mascots drag him off while Mike and Abby escape with Vanessa. Vanessa is shown to be in a coma at a hospital, and Mike and Abby return to their normal lives, their interpersonal relationship having been improved by their experiences together. But it's revealed that William is still alive as the mascots lock him in a room. Okay, so, near the end of the movie, it's revealed that Mike's career counselor, Steve Raglan, is actually the serial killer William Afton. I didn't realize that until my sister brought it up as we were leaving the theater because I forgot that Steve even existed since he only appears in maybe two scenes at the beginning and just disappears from the whole rest of the movie until the very end. So when the yellow rabbit takes its mask off and reveals himself, totally unprompted by the way, I was wondering if I was supposed to recognize that guy because I totally forgot he was even in the movie earlier. So I guess a serial killer took a job as a career counselor and he just happened to get assigned to the case of the brother of one of his victims and the entire plot of this movie hinges on this contrivance. Speaking of which, one thing that doesn't make sense is that, at the beginning, Steve is about to tell Mike he can't help him until he notices his last name in his file and realizes who he is, because him having the same last name as one of his victims is conclusive proof that they're brothers, I guess. But Mike doesn't seem to notice Steve get a little freaked out. Steve then tells Mike about the job as a night watchman at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, and after Mike is threatened with the possibility of losing custody of his little sister, he reluctantly accepts the job. But then, at the end of the movie, it's revealed that Steve Raglan is actually the serial killer William Afton, who kidnapped and murdered Mike's brother Garrett, and he gave Mike the job at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza when he realized he was the brother of one of his victims. But it's not clear why. Why would William Afton give Mike the job, knowing he was the brother of a kid he killed, especially at a restaurant he owns that he knows is haunted by the ghosts of other kids he killed? Mike never would have figured out he was his brother's killer if he never gave him the job. Is it because he wanted Mike's little sister Abby? What makes her so special that's worth that kind of risk? Did he even know Mike had a sister before he gave him the job? And after it's revealed that Vanessa is his daughter, William stabs her because he told her to keep Mike from getting too close to figuring out his secret, but she helped him solve the mystery. Of course, even though she evidently wanted to help Mike, she never just told him what was going on because the plot needed her not to. So why would William give Mike the job if he didn't want him to know what he did? And if it was because he wanted to kill Mike, why didn't he just kill him on the first night? What was stopping him from getting one of his possessed mascot robots from tearing him apart? Why did he wait until the fifth night to show up in person to kill Mike himself, when he could have just killed him at any time before then if he was so worried about him discovering who he is? And speaking of that, it's also never explained why William kills kids or why he puts their souls in mascots. By doing that, he can control them, but to what end? 
Why does he want to put the souls of children into these mascot robots? How did he figure out that he could control them by doing that? And why does he want to do that? Is he planning to make Freddy Fazbear and his gang rob a bank or something? Is he just a pervert on a power trip? Or does he have some kind of ultimate nefarious scheme that he's been working toward this whole time? The movie never explains it. It comes across like he's just being evil for the sake of being evil. And why didn't Garrett's soul go into one of the mascots like what happens with all the other kids William killed? Now, remember, I've never played any of the games except for the first one, so I don't know if there's any sort of lore explanation for any of this, but if there is, it's not in the movie. The movie just expects us to accept that the entire plot happens because of one character doing something that makes no sense according to their own motivations, which themselves are not clear. At some point, Mike's evil Aunt Jane hires a bunch of goons to break into Freddy Fazbear's pizza to trash the place and attempt to get him fired, but the mascots kill them all. It's revealed later that the ghost kids possessing the mascots are being controlled by William, which is to imply the mascots only killed the goons because he told them to. But why? What if one of them got away? What if the getaway driver, Max, just decided to drive away instead of going to look for the other goons when they didn't come out? Why kill a bunch of people and risk having the police come to investigate? Was he just mad about people trashing his already dilapidated building that he just had to risk everything? Was he worried they would succeed in getting Max fired when he was the guy who hired him and could choose whether or not to do that? I'll tell you why they had the mascots kill the goons. It's because the movie needed a body count. It needed a bunch of disposable and preferably evil characters to just show up so they could be killed, and they could put it in the trailer and make it look more like a horror movie than it actually is. And on that note, the horror aspects are probably the weakest part of the movie. There are jump scares, and it's based on a video game which is pretty much nothing but jump scares, so that's not surprising. But considering the game it's based on, there are surprisingly few. Instead, the movie mostly relies on trying to build tension and play up how scary and intimidating the mascot characters are. And the problem with that is, they're just too silly looking to be scary. Especially when it turns out the mascots are actually friendly, and all the murdering they do isn't really their fault. And they really just want to sing songs and build forts out of blankets and furniture. And that's a really bizarre tonal shift, since the first half of the movie tries to play them off as these scary monsters who just kill everything they see. And then it turns out they're all friendly and huggy. I wouldn't say the movie is scary at all, but its target audience of 12-year-old Five Nights at Freddy's fans who watch PewDiePie and Mr. Beast might be scared by it. Then again, I'm not sure any of the kids in the theater I was in were ever afraid. Speaking of which, the movie is rated PG-13, which means it's really restrained. There is a small amount of gore, but it's not any gorier than, say, a Jurassic Park movie. There's a scene where someone gets cut in half without spilling any blood, and most of the kills happen off-screen. Now, it's not like a horror movie has to be gory to be scary. People tend to think of Alien as being this extremely gory movie, but it's really just that one scene, and most of the deaths happen off-camera. But the difference between Alien and Five Nights at Freddy's is, one, Alien has a consistent tone and atmosphere, and two, Alien has a monster that's actually scary. It's a mysterious cosmic horror that could be anywhere and could pop out and get you at any time. On the other hand, Five Nights at Freddy's just has, well, the Five Nights at Freddy's characters. I guess that's all I have to say about Five Nights at Freddy's. Like this video, leave a comment, subscribe if you're not already, and if you are, check my channel for other videos you may have missed since YouTube doesn't always tell you when I upload. Also, support me on Patreon and send me your fan art. The links are below. Bye.